All right, hello everybody. I uh, hope you're having a great Tuesday evening. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. Tonight we'll be covering injury prevention for runners. Uh, maybe one of the most common and popular topics when it, when it comes to distance running and, and all endurance sports, to be honest with you, just because the injury rates are so high. Um, so many people are looking to find and those strategies, sometimes those quick fixes to hopefully reduce their risk of injury so they can continue to run, enjoy themselves and see great results from a performance standpoint. Now, before we get started, let me cover a few quick housekeeping items. Um, do me a favor and silence any technology around you, whether that's a cell phone, TV. Um, as you'll see, I like to dig into the research and understand uh, what are some of the things we can prove for the, through the literature and then share that with you today. So a lot of little details that I wanna make sure you get the most from. Um, somewhere on your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Do me a favor right now and click that Q&A button. Uh, what we'll do with this throughout, the, throughout this evening, throughout the entire webinar is this is your place if you want to ask questions, provide feedback, share anything from your personal experience with me. I'm always open to hearing some of those things from you. So feel free to interact throughout the webinar. Right now, while you have that open, do me a favor and actually write in there your name where you're from, and what is the most important thing you wish to get from the webinar this evening? And rather than just injury prevention, right, that is so uh, so general, what are those smaller things that you wish to learn tonight that hopefully I can add directly within the webinar to help you potentially see the best results possible moving forward? So take a second and do that. Name where you're from and what is the most important thing you wish to get from the webinar this evening? I'm gonna hang out here for about 30 seconds or so. Get a couple of responses. And then we'll, we'll get rolling after that. Joanne, hope you're doing well. I saw your message there and as you signed up, uh, prevent injuries, get past injuries. Thanks for joining. Julie, gotta love the research. I know you're probably a, probably a nerd like me. Rachel, how to learn proper techniques to run for fun. Awesome. Uh, we won't go too deep into running mechanics today, but we'll talk about the whys behind a proper program. Some of the stuff you and I just spoke about uh, last night as well. Joe, welcome, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, good daily stretch routines to, to support healthy running. We're going to definitely dive into stretching. Um, this could be a little controversial to some people, but at least it will can provide a little bit more guidance in what the research currently says regarding stretching. All right, guys. So anyone else, Bob, hope you're doing well. Uh, learn how to more consist, be more consistent with non-running activities to stay moving. That is awesome. Uh, we'll definitely talk about that towards the end. We talk about footwear and different things, about uh, participating in different sports. It has a huge protective uh, factor for the body. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks for joining me tonight. Anyone else, feel free to write in there. I'm going to get moving just to make sure I don't take up too much of your time this evening. But those of you that have uh, wrote in already, written in already, I, I appreciate that. Now, as we get going, feel free to drop more notes, anything in that, uh, that Q&A area right there. I will be raffling off at the very end a free injury risk assessment. This is brand new. This is something I just created, different than all my other offerings. Um, a lot of people are just, just want to understand, hey, as I get ready or train for this race, what are the things I need to take into consideration, right? Rather than just saying, you need to strength train, you need to stretch, you need to do this. Uh, what areas of the body are the most susceptible to injury, right? We can do that from a good analysis standpoint, just to identify the most susceptible areas to injury, analyze running mechanics and movement quality, and then I'll help you craft actually a specific program to really address those risk factors, uh, in those areas from a, again, a movement, but also a running form standpoint. So that's what we're going to be raffling off at the very end for one lucky person. If you are not that one lucky person, I highly recommend, uh, and I'll share this link later on, I'll text this to you closer to eight o'clock. Um, if you don't win, schedule that customization call. I always tell people, don't, don't just be that person behind the screen that, that watches these webinars uh, and listens, but doesn't take action. This is my attempt to help you as much as possible. And it's not a sales pitch in disguise. I'm not trying to sell you on working together. If you need help, I'm going to tell you, hey, this is how I can help you. But my idea through this customization call is just to help you individualize the strategies in the webinar, understand a little bit more about you, your goals, your injury history, so I can provide some guidance and some feedback moving forward. But I'll share that link a little bit later on. Um, if you cannot stay for the entire webinar for whatever reason, I will be 
um, sending their webinar replay and the winner of the raffle tomorrow at 11 a.m. So make sure you are checking that if you are not the if you do not check that email and get back to me, I do move on to the next person. So 11 a.m. tomorrow Eastern time, check that email, see if you're the winner. If not, schedule that customization call. Now, let me take a second to introduce myself. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. I'm a licensed athletic trainer and strength conditioning coach. I also do a type of manual therapy called uh, active release techniques, um, working on can, chronic overuse injuries, nerve entrapments, those kinds of things. Uh, originally from Boston, Massachusetts, currently in Michigan. Uh, that picture on the right side of the screen, it was uh, several years ago, just doing some fly fishing out here on the lake, um, which, I, which I love to do. But with my programs, my primary goal is just to help people become a happier, more fulfilled version of themselves. I don't care who that person is, what that person does or wants to do, right? That matters. But just trying to use movement as a gateway to improve fulfillment and happiness in life. A lot of the runners that I work with want to get faster, want to recover from an injury, prevent injuries from happening just to run on a consistent basis to um, can become better in some way. And I do this through the healthy running program with runners and endurance athletes. I also do this with the general population with what I call the functionally fit program. Now, what I want you to learn today from the webinar, we're going to cover the most common injuries associated with running several of those risk factors, right? Personal risk factors, but also biomechanical risk factors that could potentially increase your risk of injury. We'll review some of the common injury prevention strategies. We'll look at specifically and dive into the research on foam rolling, static stretching, and strength training. Um, a lot of conflicting research on those, but uh, I think it will definitely point you in a, in a direction. You can decide what is the best for you. We'll talk quickly about footwear. Not going to go too deep in that on different kinds of shoes and things like that, but just a really good research study that came out, I think, uh, three, three years or so ago um, on how we can actually think about footwear in a way that could reduce our risk of injury. And then we'll kind of summarize some things just to give you some good advice moving forward. But ultimately, I want to share the research with you. Um, provide some again, personal practical application in here, and then you decide what is best for you moving forward. I think that's the most important thing. Now, in injury prevention attainable. I actually try to do my best to get away from saying injury prevention altogether. It's a good uh, buzzword for a webinar. Unfortunately, there's no way to prevent injury, right? Injury is going to happen at some point. Research shows that anywhere from 20 to 70, huge range, right? 20 to 70% of runners, runners get injured each and every year. There's really too many factors to consider and stay on top of to uh, prevent injuries from occurring altogether. Some of the research actually says the only way to prevent a running related injury is to stop running. So uh, I know obviously we're not going to do that. So we need to understand how can we mitigate our risk uh, how do we address the risk factors, run in a smarter, uh, more educated way so we can offset the risk of injury moving forward? Some of the most common run-related injuries that you'll see uh, through the research, medial tibial stress syndrome, whether you're struggling with shin splints or some type of tibial stress fracture or stress reaction, right? Right in that shin bone there, Achilles tendinopathy, and that Achilles tendon is that uh, that connection between the calf, the calf to the heel cord, right into the heel bone. Plantar fasciitis is that the fascia on the bottom side of the foot. Most runners know about plantar fasciitis or have suffered from some kind of, again, feeling first thing in the morning, like you're stepping on broken glass, some sharp stabbing pain towards the arch in the heel area down there. Patellar tendinopathy is another one, right? The patellar tendon is what connects the front just below the kneecap to the top of the shin bone there. So biggest thing you need to understand is the majority of these, the most prevalent running related injuries actually happen from the knee down. Okay. So why that matters is because when you're trying to prevent injuries or reduce the likelihood of injury, we know where most of them happen. Let's address these, right? Let's, let's get these areas stronger, more stable. Let's work on balance and stability. Let's work on alignment and control and just building up good resilience in these tissues. Um, and that will help reduce the risk of injury as we run. Now, different factors which influence injury risk. Um, and you'll see as I go through here, uh, I know Julie said a second ago to review the research. If you're if you're a nerd like us and you actually want to look into some of this stuff, you'll see there are again cited research articles right here. This is where I pulled information from. This is a lot of this is nothing that I've uh, I believe or I've created. I pull the research and I, I use the research to kind of. Uh, Again, I, I transfer that over to you is what I'm trying to do here this evening. But what we see from an injury risk standpoint is actually running not enough is almost as problematic as running too much. Some of the research shows that running greater than 40 miles per week, right, increases your risk of injury. 
Um, some research shows that the, the more you run on average, the more protective that is to injury. So it's very interesting, right? A little conflicting to a degree, but we also see not running enough. And I, why I wanted to share that was because we need to understand that we need enough load. We need enough stress on the system, right? We want to challenge the body to a certain degree. So it's strong and resilient. If we run once in a while, once a week, sometimes twice a week, and we're trying to really either build up mileage or continue to do this on a long-term basis, that can actually be pretty problematic. Research shows less than two hours per week or less than two sessions a week actually increased your risk of injury. Um, what they also did find from this research article was half of all running related injuries are related to training errors and could be preventable. We're not sure what those specific errors are because there's so many different variables within that, but we always tend to go to biomechanics first. We go to movement. We say my knee hurts because my quad is weak. My knee hurts because my IT band is tight, right? We throw out all these things when in reality running needs to be the first thing we look at. We'll talk about that more in a second here. Um, within your program itself, some other kind of training variable variables are, are you increasing your mileage too quickly? or are you increasing your speed too quickly? We'll talk about the uh, progressive overload principle here in a second, but we need to do things in a very gradual, systematic way as we progress from one level to the next, as we go from just for simplicity sake, from 10 miles a week to 12 to 14 to 16, take a step back to 12 to 16 to 18, right? We do things in a very uh, progressive manner to train the tissues to withstand the loads and the, the repetitiveness of running. What's interesting though, is there are certain injuries that are actually associated with certain training errors, right? So if you're increasing your mileage too quickly, usually that, that kind of the cutoff right there, that threshold is increasing more than about 30% per week. Um, you'll see injuries like IC band syndrome at the lateral portion of the knee, patellotendinopathy, patellofemoral pain syndrome, glute med, uh, tendinopathy, usually uh, trochanteric bursitis, which on that lateral portion of the hip, medial tibial stress syndrome, which we talked about before. These are things that you'll typically see from increasing your running mileage too quickly. You want to have enough time that uh, depends on the person, right? I have some people that follow 12 week programs, 16 week programs, 18, 20 week programs. Some of my ultra runners, right? They're out there for uh, a long period of time. They might go through five to six months of a training plan to build up for that distance, right? We need to really follow and progress our mileage in a very systematic and gradual way. So we're not overloading our tissues. From a speed standpoint, some of the things you'll see from increasing speed too quickly, Achilles tendinopathy, hamstring strains, tibial stress fractures, hip flexor strains, any type of calf or Achilles issues, uh, plantar fasciitis, right? So I always recommend for people when we talk about running and this is when I look at their running program, I always do this uh, in addition to evaluating the body, looking at running form, looking at strength, looking at range of motion, looking at all those biomechanical things. We need to look at the running plan to see, okay, where are we, where could we potentially get better? We want to, from a, a principal standpoint, frequency first. So be able to run more days per week, not necessarily high mileage, but be able to, uh, to run most days without issue. We want to go to duration second, be able to increase our mileage on select days, right? We have our short runs, we have our long runs, our medium distance runs. And then from there, we want to go to speed. A lot of people always go to speed very quickly within the training program, right? It's, it's more fun, speed or hills or some type of intensity variable. Um, but you need to have that frequency and duration first. That creates a nice wide base that we then can put speed on top of, right? So this should be the last thing you address within your running plan. Like I mentioned a second ago, uh, research skin, we see 50%, we see 60% in some other studies, but for this one here, 60% of running related injuries are due to training errors. So the first thing you need to do, if you're experiencing some type of pain, look at your training program first. Um, were there any issues along the way? Uh, did you increase too quickly? When did the pain happen? What kind of pain is it? Um, and see if you can link it to something within your training plan. 40% um, of, of injuries are related to biomechanics. So uh, how do you move? How do you run, right? Just, just how your, your, your normal movement and motions are, strength, range of motion, any imbalances or asymmetries from side to side. Um, these are the things that are, are secondary uh, things to look at, right? Running plan first, biomechanics second. We always flip these. We always say, oh, I have pain. Let me get my running form analyzed. Why is that happening? 
And then we end up continuously running through getting into the same problems because it was the training program that was the problem. We address biomechanics, which is always helpful, right? You can't go wrong doing that, but that wasn't the primary reason we started experiencing pain in the first place. Different risk factors that can be associated with injury. We have age, body mass index, previous injury, which is huge. Um, from an age standpoint, looking at actually our actual age, right? How old are you? Um, knowing that if you're let me just say 70 years old, you've been running for four years, there's a good chance that, again, your training age is going to actually help you reduce the likelihood of injury because you've been training for a long period of time. So you build up some resilience um, and some tolerance to the demands of running. If you're 17 or 50 and you just started running a year ago and you're new, okay, right? Your training age is very low. So not just saying older people are more likely to become injured, people that have just started training. So their training age is one big thing to take in consideration. Those are the people that want to start slower, maybe don't want to progress up to a full marathon so quickly. Maybe want to take your time throughout your training program, 5K, 10K, half marathon, get some of those out of your, under your belt there for a couple of years and then progress forward. So really being smart on how you progress your program, depending on how long your training, uh, how high your training age is. Body mass index is actually interesting. We, we always assume that if we are, we want to lose weight to become a better runner. When in reality, if we have a higher body mass index, we actually see that we have more bone mineral density. So body mass, higher body mass could actually be people with that could actually be less susceptible to bone stress injuries, just because over a period of time, our bones, our bones are stronger and more resilient to the demands. Um, just because we have more, more weight, which is going to stress the bones to a greater degree, as opposed to someone that's lighter. Um, so it's very interesting and, and sometimes opposite of what you would think when you look at some of these, some of these risk factors, previous injury is very important. This is something that's going to come up multiple times throughout the webinar this evening. If you have experienced an injury in the past, the chance of that injury coming back is much more likely than you sustaining a brand new or a different injury. So you need to make sure you fully go through that rehab process. What is the injury? What tissue is affected? What is the reason why that tissue is affected, right? Just because it's your plantar fascia, was it the plantar fascia that's the problem? Was there some kind of calf weakness, issues at the hip, leg length discrepancies, right? Are there other things that could have predisposed you to that? I need to address all those things the right way over the right period of time, where there's a very likely chance that that will happen again in the future. Um, running surface, right? Are we changing surface and, and placing different stresses on the body? Are we always running on concrete? And then we run on trail, always running on trails. We run on concrete and something flares up, right? So just understanding the running surfaces that you predominantly use, usually variety is, is a good thing or understanding if you're going to switch surfaces, do so in a smart way. Don't just switch surface and go out in your long run, right? Maybe that's better suited for one of your shorter runs just to expose the body to that different demand. Um, and then some of these biomechanical things, looking at foot pronation, hip adduction, right? Is that foot landing too far underneath the midline of the body, hip internal rotation? Are we internally rotated the hips or running in more of a pigeon toed position? Um, pelvic control, we, as we land and strike the ground, is our pelvis on our opposite side dropping or any muscle weakness, which we'll actually talk about here in a second. So runners do not sustain a running related injury only because they're overweight, older, or have had a previous injury. Running related injuries can only occur when people practice running, sorry, it's cut off on my screen here. Um, so you need to run, right? You need to run to experience a running related injury. Now, different principles. I'm very principle based with what I do. Um, principles stand and they, they just last the test, of, the test of time, right? We, a lot of times jump from fad to fad, from trend to trend. But if we have a good series of principles behind that really allow us to uh, and make good decisions moving forward, usually you see a lot better results by staying true to the principles. First one is specificity. So specificity just means being as specific as possible. A couple of different ways we can do that. One, what does your body need? What do you need to be a successful runner? How do you adopt and really outline a good program that works for you as an individual? And then on the other end of this is how do we specifically train our body to withstand the demands of running? We know running pretty well at this point. We know the demands, we know the stresses, we know the range of motion. How do we get better in those areas, right? Rather than just doing random stuff and hoping it's going to make us a better runner. Um, how do we be as specific as possible to the demands of running so we can see the best long-term results? Progressive overload is something I mentioned earlier. Uh, the, one of the most simple principles that often gets overlooked, I find people uh, 
either are doing things right are not are not following a good structured program that's building up and progressing over the right period of time you're either doing that too quickly or they're just haphazardly putting runs and, and, and putting different things together in a program and hoping for the best. Also from a strength training standpoint, right? We want to really use that off season period of time. So for instance, after a lot of you finish your goal race this fall, October, November, December, when you're done with that goal race, before you get into a structured training plan in January, that's your off season. Can you progressively overload the body with a good strength training program, then back down and then progressively overload the body with a good running program, right? So you have that foundation in place first to put good running mileage on top of very important, but just always thinking about how do I progressively make things a little bit harder up until that taper and then take a step back and prepare for race day. And variable loading is very, very important because again, a second ago, I talked about being specific. Now we're talking about more variety within the program. Um, so like Bob mentioned a second ago in his question, uh, other sports really fit very well into this. We need to understand very, running is a very uh, predictable movement pattern, right? The loads, the, the plane of motion, all of this stuff, we, it, it's the same over and over again. As much as this is good, and it's predictable and it's specific and we can train to get better at that movement pattern, this increases our risk of injury if we continue to do things the same way over and over again. So if we add some variability within the program, whether that's movement in multiple planes of motion, whether that's different forces, whether it's playing different sports, um, runners that play tennis or play basketball, that jump, that land, that change direction, soccer, doing stuff with your kids in, in different ways that's more unpredictable. That stuff is huge for the human body, right? A lot of the, if we go back to even uh, college and youth sports right now, right? A lot of the coaches are looking for people that are good athletes, well rounded uh, three season athletes first that then specialize in their sport because they have that better foundation. They probably have, can attain a higher peak because they have a better foundation of athleticism. We want that to a degree here alongside our running. And then lastly, respect your injury history. So if you suffered from an injury in the past, you need to make sure you stay on top of that and continue to stay on top of that. There's a good chance that that will come back at some point, um, but you want to continue to load that area. So if it's the foot, your calf raises, your, your, your exercises, your toe yoga, your things that are strengthening the foot and the arch of the foot. Those might be things you continue to do for a long period of time. Um, I think a lot of people run into, pro, uh, run into trouble a lot of times with, with physical therapy, either again, insurance and paying for any more, they go through uh, 12 visits, they go for 24 visits and then they're done. We need to make sure we don't get to just get to the point of we've eliminated pain and then we're fine just to get out and continue with running, right? As soon as we eliminate pain, that's the first step. Now we address, can we improve function? Can we improve strength, can we improve power, stability, balance, all of these things, put that on top of resolving that issue. Um, and that will hopefully help keep these things at bay long-term. Now, for a second, I wanna put a quick little poll up on the screen. This was giving me trouble earlier. So hopefully the screen, everything works out. Yeah, it's kind of messing up here a little bit on my end. So. A quick little poll I just flashed up on the screen right there. Just a simple question to see how well you guys are paying attention so far. Question number one, majority of running related injuries happen from the knee down. Is that true or false? Question two, how many percent of running related injuries can be attributed to training errors? 30, 50, 60, or 75. Three, specifically, uh, specificity, progressive overload, variable loading, and respecting your injury history are all principles that should guide your injury prevention program. Is that true or false? Going to let a few of you answer here. As I check to see if I missed anything in the Q&A, doesn't look like I did from earlier. Anyone has any questions so far, feel free to drop that right now as we wait for a few people to answer here. We're gonna wait till we get about 80%. We have 66% have completed this. So another one or two. And we'll move on to the injury prevention strategies. 77%, perfect, 88. Oh, we got some mixed results here. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if this is messing up your screen as well. It's messing up mine. All right, so question one, majority of running related injuries happen from the knee down. That is true, okay. Uh, how many percent of running related injuries can be attributed to training errors? Trick question there, that is 50% and 60%. I've, I've said two different things based on two different research articles earlier. Um, so five of you got that right. Um, so maybe make sure to look at your running program first. Are there any issues with your training program? And then go biomechanical second. Three, specificity, progressive overload. All those principles should guide your injury prevention program. Easy. That was 
true. Okay. All right, so let's move on here. Sorry, I don't know if this is messing up on your end, but it's kind of looking funny on my end right now every time I click that. Now, injury prevention. So like I mentioned, I want to talk about foam rolling, static stretching, and strength training. These are the common things most runners go to and say, hey, I want to use this to prevent injuries. Uh, like I mentioned, we cannot prevent injuries, but let's see how well, uh, how much improvement or how much this can actually help us from an injury prevention standpoint based on the research. So first up, let's get into foam rolling. Foam rolling, simply put, is a form of self-massage, right? You can see on the top right, foam rolling the calf, uh, gastroc soleus area in the bottom, doing some upper body foam rolling to the lat with some movement, right? Just compressing, working into the tissue. Um, not going to say why we're doing that necessarily, but common tools that you can use, again, not just saying foam rollers, but self-mouth fascia release when we have uh, massage bars and sticks and uh, trigger point balls, golf balls, lacrosse balls, the Theracane, right? All that stuff is a type of self mouth fascia release. The research studies that we'll talk about here in a second are more specifically foam rollers and the massage, like the massage sticks that you'll use. Now, some of the goals that people are commonly after when they're implementing foam rolling, warm up the tissues, increase flexibility, enhance the recovery process, reduce delayed onset muscle soreness, and then also reduce the perception of pain. There was a very uh, good meta-analysis that usually combines, okay, what does all the research say? And can we compile that into one study rather than having 21 studies that need to sift through individually? So 21 research studies met their criteria. 14 of them studied foam rolling before activity, seven studied foam rolling after activity. Um, like I mentioned, foam rollers and kind of massage bars and sticks. Um, overall, from this research, it was determined that the effects of foam rolling on performance and recovery are rather minor and partly negligible, but can be relevant in some cases. So we'll talk about what are those cases. Rolling before activity. For elite athletes, this is interesting, right? There was a small improvement in sprint performance, about an improvement about 0.7%. Um, they actually said specifically in the article, it probably doesn't matter that much for recreational athletes, but we're talking about Olympic level uh, athletes, 0.7% could be the difference of being on the podium and being off the podium, right? So there's a small improvement in sprint performance when ro foam rolling before activity. There's a temporary increase in flexibility. However, that increase in flexibility is only about 10 to 15 minutes after foam rolling. So what, we're, what we typically see when it comes to foam rolling, there's not a huge long-term benefit to foam rolling. A lot of the results are very short-lived, right? 10 to 15 minutes. Or I'll, in a sec, I'll talk about pain, which is, is also short-lived. Um, what we're seeing through some of the research and as we start to test some of the tissues and see, okay, how do these tissues respond to the pressure and the compression of foam rolling? Uh, the pressure actually required to deform our tissue is greater than we're actually a lot able to provide with the foam roller. So people say, hey, I'm breaking up adhesions, I'm breaking up scar tissue. That most likely is not the case just because we're not applying as much force that is necessary to actually change that tissue. Um, reasons behind improvement are merely speculation to this point, and they're not really based on direct scientific observation. We don't really even know what's going on with foam rolling yet that hasn't been fully uh, decided or proven within the research. We have a lot of different hypotheses going on out there. We kind of speculate that we're what we're seeing, so it's, it's hard to say conclusively. Let's see. Uh, thanks, Cam. Hope you have a great night. Now, foam rolling after activity. So we can see a reduction in pain perception. This is awesome when, when it comes to running, right? When the injury rates are so high and we're constantly feeling some type of ache or pain. Um, we don't understand exactly why we're seeing that perception, the, the reduction in pain perception. But if you foam roll for 10 minutes, you could potentially reduce your perception of pain for up to 30 minutes after foam rolling. Again, it's not going to alleviate that pain forever, but you can just alter something with this again, neurophysiological or something going on there that's going to just cut off that sensation of pain. Also, if you are in sore, you're, you're strength training, you're running, you're running, you're strength training, you're doing multiple bouts of activity in the same day, foam rolling after activity between bouts of activity can minimize the exercise induced and decrease in sprint and strength performance. So if you are 
it doesn't matter which order you're doing that in running in the morning, strength training in the evening, like, man, that run got me sore. It was a speed workout. I have a strength training session later doing some kind of foam rolling will still allow you to feel strong, to feel ready for your session. Uh, if it's the other way around and you do strength training in the morning, you can still perform fairly well. If you add a small bout of foam rolling in between, um, there has been no concrete evidence on foam rolling, reducing trigger points. These are some of the things we kind of just people throw out there. Hey, Foam rolling reduces, uh, gets rid of trigger points. It breaks up adhesions. It realigns scar tissue, right? Uh, we don't even know if any of that stuff is actually true to this point. So if you're going to foam roll, I always recommend moving afterwards. We see this short window where it actually is potentially beneficial. We can reduce pain perception. We can increase flexibility. We can temporarily reduce soreness. So we want to make sure we're moving the body. We're increasing blood flow, circulation. We're moving our tissues to a greater range of motion, especially if we want to increase flexibility. We don't just foam roll to foam roll by itself. We do it in more of a bigger, well-rounded plan. Um, there is, we are, again, like I said, we're currently unclear of the mechanism. There's no consensus on duration, speed, depth, or frequency. We have no, long, no idea how long to do it, how deep to go, uh, how many rolls per tissue, how many times per day. So really do what's best for you. Foam rolling is a strategy that you feel like is beneficial. Um, existing literature, this provides some evidence to support the utilization of foam rolling interventions in sports practice. However, the limited evidence should be considered prior to integrating foam rolling as a warm-up activity and or recovery tool. We hear this is kind of the golden thing for runners to do, endurance athletes. There's really not a lot of research to back that up. It could potentially help, um, but if it does, it's, it's most likely a short-term benefit. Now, Dawn, who I've been working with, she's a year and a half or so. Um, she said, I know that finding time for strength training is often an issue. We'd rather be running. But one of the things I've noticed soon after starting with Derek's program was that my legs were really sore, rarely sore, even after an 18 mile trail run. So I don't need to take time for daily foam rolling and random stretching or monthly massages. I think Garrett would say that because my legs are stronger, they are better equipped to handle the running, right? So we understand why are we foam rolling in the first place? Are our legs always sore? Can we get stronger? Would that be a better strategy that would not just allow our legs to feel better as we run, but also potentially improve performance? Do you have limited flexibility? Should we just work on mobility, right? I always challenge people, is there a better strategy that's proven through the research? Foam rolling is very iffy. Use that in conjunction with something else if you want to, if you feel like it's helpful to you. But there are a lot of other things that we know do positively help address a lot of these key things that we're using foam rolling for. Um, so a lot of times I just kind of, let's, let's do that. That's kind of my perspective on this. Now, static stretching. Okay, static stretching here, a couple different uh, options. We can stretch anything in the body, right? Any tissue, muscle, tendon, ligament, we can put that on stretch, joint. Um, static stretching basically is holding a stationary position to lengthen a specific muscle for a given period of time. Hip flexor stretch, we have the top, pigeon stretch in the bottom. Um, very common stretches for runners. Research, I'll get into that in a second, sorry. The goals of stretching, right? Are we increasing flexibility? We're trying to reduce soreness and improve recovery, improve performance, prevent injury. These are the typical reasons why a lot of people are adding stretching within their program. I don't see many runners looking like this in terms of flexibility, right? Unless you're a gymnast or a ballerina or something. But um, we need to understand when it comes to stretching or, or just think about is more range of motion actually going to reduce our likelihood of injury? right? We look at the picture at the top left of your screen, this guy running, let's compare his hip range of motion to Simone Biles here on the right side, right? This is drastically different. This is the, the extent of the range of motion he needs to go through as he, as he runs. It's really not a lot of range of motion. Running is called a mid-range sport. Um, gymnastics here is an end range sport, right? They're Every single time, every jump, every flip, every tumbling pass, they're going to their, their bodies, their joints, their tissues limit in terms of range of motion because they're moving their body in such an extreme way. Running is just not like that. So more range of motion is not always better. Yes, Simone Biles, we probably want her to work on flexibility in some way so she can tolerate and, and handle those positions well. But a normal recreational or even elite runner, we don't need a whole lot of flexibility or, or, or range of motion. If we do need range of motion, it actually comes in three specific places. So these are always the places when people ask, should I stretch? I say, I don't know. How are you at these three places? I don't want to give that away just yet, right? We don't need to stretch everything, um, but we need to make sure certain joints can move in certain ways to get us through that running cycle in a nice, healthy, and efficient way. First one, the hip, 
an extension. So this woman right here, you can see as she's pushing off, she's driving through the hip. We want a certain degree of extension to be able to push the ground away to propel the body forward. Uh, some of my runners that I see, especially when they start limited hip extension, they have trouble actually pushing off and driving away, ends up creating over, them over striding and reaching too far in front of the body's center of mass rather than pushing the ground away from them. Hip extension is one of the most important motions when it comes to running. Next up, ankle dorsiflexion. So as you get to mid stance phase of running, foot's on the ground, body starts to transfer over that foot and then the foot and the, the hip push you away. We need enough ankle dorsiflexion to get that ankle in a flex position uh, because what this does, it allows us to get into the end of the stance phase to actually push off. If we don't, we see again, early heel lift, that foot comes on the ground a little sooner, we lose that whole propulsion phase of running. So ankle dorsiflexion with, if we think of in this position, the toes in the top of the foot being pulled up to the shin, that's ankle dorsiflexion. We need enough of that when we run. Last one is the great toe, right? Big toe extension. Um, as we get into the end, as we go to push off, right? We already talked a second ago about the hip. We want to get hip extension. We also want to extend into the big toe to be able to, and place that plantar fascia on a nice length of position, activate that wind last mechanism, which creates a rigid lever at the foot that we can then propel the body forward. Um, most people aren't thinking about these three, right? Most people are thinking about how do I stretch the quads? Uh, how do I stretch the piriformis and hip rotators? How do I stretch the lower back, right? It's okay to stretch those things, but you think from a mechanic standpoint, these are the areas or the three ranges of motion where you're actually challenged to a greater degree to your end range of motion right? So everything else is kind of just comfortably within that middle range of motion. We don't need a lot of range of motion there. These are the areas where you actually need enough range of motion to run properly. So I definitely recommend thinking about those. Through some of the research here um, from a long time ago, actually, um, stretching does not appreci appreciably reduce your injury risk. So they studied uh, a lot of people. They found that thus on average, about 100 people stretch for 12 weeks to prevent one injury. And the average subject would need to stretch for 23 years to prevent one injury. So do we need to stretch just to stretch? No, we don't. Do my runners stretch? Yeah, everyone does in some way. But we, we understand the body, right? We evaluate. We look at running form. We see you know, we have a difference in the hip from this side to the other side. I want to address that. I want to even things out from side to side. But from a general injury prevention standpoint, static stretching has not necessarily been proven to prevent injury. I still use it in some various ways, not a lot of traditional static stretching, um, but in various ways to help improve range of motion, balance the body from one side to the other side, and just restore function of the body. But I don't go into it telling people if we just stretch this, you're not going to get injured here. I never say that um, just because it hasn't been proven through the, the literature. Now, static stretching does not reduce your risk of injury, improve performance, or reduce muscle soreness. If you have limited range of motion or asymmetric hip extension, ankle dorsiflexion, big toe extension, like I mentioned a second ago, the three most important ranges of motion to run, address it with the appropriate strategy, might be stretching, mobility drills, could be joint mobilizations, manipulation. There could be other reasons, other ways to address these things. Um, biggest thing, if you're someone that always feels tight, you ask yourself, why do you feel tight? I have people all the time that stretch and stretch and stretch. And my calf, my calf is always tight. It's it, every time I run, it's at mile six, it starts to break down and it feels really tight. Is that calf tight or is that tightness a symptom or a, just a subjective uh, perception of how that calf is feeling because it's weak, because you're running improperly or uh, your type of foot strike pattern, right? Is there a reason why that calf is tightening up? Stretching a lot of times doesn't get to the root cause. A lot of these reasons we need to understand and evaluate and look at some of the underlying things uh, besides just stretching every sensation of tightness. Now, from a strength training standpoint, just to summarize here, physical activity, utilizing body weight or equipment to target a muscle tendon joint or bone, couple of different examples here. Top one step up with a slow eccentric single leg, working on strength, balance, stability, and just controlling the body through the single leg motion. On the bottom, we have trap bar deadlift. I usually use this to can load up people a little bit more, good axial load to help build bone mineral density, build strength, build power. Um, but that is strength training, which you all should know. My grandmother here on the left side, uh, she's been strength training for, geez, since the 50s. 
right? So you can see her uh, deadlifting all that weight right there. But uh, goals of strength training, increase muscular strength, endurance and power, improve balance and stability, improve performance, prevent injury. These are the things people are commonly after when they add a strength training program into the mix. When we look at strength training as a standalone in a general way, um, this was actually the 2019 New York City Marathon, I believe, right before... COVID year, my years are all, all messed up now since the last uh, year and a half has kind of been so crazy, but they, they had a control group, which just trained, completed the race. They had a, uh, a, a testing group, which actually went through a 12 week strength training program. Their thought was the group that completed the strength training program would dec they would have a, a reduced risk or reduced injury rate while training and completing that marathon. And the strength training would actually improve their finishing times. Um, what they found was again, they did not decrease their overall risk of injury or their overall injury rate. Um, they were about injured to about the same as the group that didn't complete the strain training. And I think this is important to understand when it comes to some of these studies. So just giving a group of people, 20 people, 30 people, 40 people, a strength training program saying doing that, we're not really tailoring it to that specific need. So for those of you out there that are completing a general strength training program, that's a great start. It, we can't go wrong with the body, improving strength, balance, stability, power. Um, we need those things, especially as that we decline, we lose some of those characteristics as we age. But from a running standpoint, it's almost it's almost too general. And strength training in a general way, as you see here, doesn't necessarily translate over uh, to help reduce the likelihood of prevent injury. And from a, a weakness standpoint, right, looking at uh, the study looked at female runners, a 16 week strength training program. Uh, what they found when they looked at the runners that completed the strength training program versus runners that didn't weakness really at the hip or the knee wasn't really a characteristic of those who got injured versus non-injured. So a lot of times we think, Oh, I'm weak. I got injured, right? Weakness. If we can build up a weakness to get stronger, we're possibly more tolerant to the demands of running because we're not stressing the body to its max as much. Um, but you'd be surprised that the places that I've worked in the past, I've worked with people that, pushing sleds, doing deadlifts, doing heavy strength training. Those people still got injured. And I have people that have never done strength training ever in their life who have never suffered from a running related injury. So we can't say weakness necessarily will predispose you to injury or just getting stronger will reduce your likelihood of injury. There's so many other factors involved that we need to take into consideration. So how does strength training ultimately help runners? It can help you improve running speed and endurance. It can improve neuro, a lot of the neuromuscular characteristics, the power, um, the, the timing, the coordination of just your overall movement. It can prevent decline in bone and muscle mass as we age. Very important, right? Well, runners are more susceptible to bone stress injuries. And if we're losing bone and muscle mass, we become more susceptible to those things. So increasing tolerance, the repetitive demands of running. And we can also address some of the risk factors associated with injuries. We know some of the things, we know the most common injuries. We know some of the most common risk factors within our strength training program. Can we address those things to make sure they are not can as likely to create some type of injury issue? Uh, issue sorry, we're not going to get rid of them altogether, but if we can, can reduce the prevalence of that causing a problem, that's what we tend we need to think about a little bit more with our strength training program. I'm not sure general programs do that as much because it's not taken into consideration the individual aspect of that person, right? It's not specific as much as, as much as it should be going back to the principles, um, but still helpful to a degree. What we need to understand from a running form standpoint is strength training alone might not actually allow us to improve our running form regardless of how we uh, craft that program. So this is a six week study um, looked at how do we get people stronger, more stable and have better form within a single leg squat. Single leg squat is very specific to running on a single leg. You're just kind of sitting, lowering back, tapping the butt down and standing back up um, as opposed to kind of a bilateral squat on two legs. So pretty specific to running, right? Single leg focus, balance, stability, control, um, they, after they strengthened these people, taught them this movement, um, strengthened them, ran them through a whole different bunch of exercises. They found, they saw significant gains in strength, right? The hip abductors, the hip external rotators, they improved single leg form and stability and balance, right? These people got significantly better, improved alignment, better pelvic control and single leg stance, right? All of these things, when they rechecked their running mechanics, there was no change in the running mechanics. So a lot of times we assume, hey, just because I'm stronger, I'm going to run better. You might be a faster, uh, more stable, uh, 
with better endurance runner, but that doesn't necessarily mean form is going to change in any way. So what this study suggests is that strengthening alone may not be adequate to alter the underlying abnormal movement patterns that may be associated with pathology. That's why with all my runners, regardless of whether they are injured, healthy, looking to improve performance, wanting to reduce the likelihood of injury, doesn't matter. We do a running analysis every single time. I don't risk any more like I used to. In the past, we used to just do an evaluation. What is our strength? What is our range of motion? Let's create a program. Some of those people got injured. And unless I look at the running form to see, is there anything abnormal here, right? We, we can't miss that key characteristic. If you're gonna go out there and run mile after mile, you wanna make sure you're doing it in a somewhat efficient way. It doesn't have to be perfect. There's no perfect running form, uh, but can we address the key things to make sure you're just a little bit more resilient to the demands of running? Now, from a strength training standpoint, if we just summarize some of the research, strength training reduces the risk factors associated with injury. However, alone has not been shown to prevent injury, right? And running retraining is needed in addition to a strength training program, just to make sure if you're working on balance, working on stability, working all these key things that we want to translate to running, we need to add some type of drills or running retraining in there, whether we're uh, teaching someone how to do that on a treadmill uh, and, and really walking them through verbally how, instructing them how to adjust their running form. We're adding marching drills, skipping drills, different things with the metronome or what have you, right? We have a lot of different ways we can do running retraining. That needs to happen in addition to strength training if there's some type of abnormal moving patterns or abnormal running mechanics that need to be addressed. Now, this is Megan. Megan's a, a previous uh, college runner. So she said, though I've always understood strength training to be an essential component of remaining healthy while running, it has only been in recent years that I discovered the importance of running specific strength training. Post-collegially, I dealt with several injuries that could have been prevented had I known, maybe not prevented, um, that had I known my individual weaknesses and addressed them proactively, right? This is what we need to do a better job at being proactive. We respond to all these issues. How do we get ahead of things, address the risk factors, address our bodies to help mitigate our risk of injury because we're not going to prevent it altogether. Knowing what I need to strengthen in order to achieve my running goals have given me clarity and confidence in my ability to stay healthy. Now, from a footwear standpoint, role of footwear, right? We always go to running shoes, go to the running store to get fitted, fleet feet, uh, uh, running lab, uh, run Nashville, right? A lot of different places that I've dealt with in the past um, when it comes to running through gazelle sports. So goals of footwear, providing support, shock absorption, correct biomechanical faults, improve performance, prevent injury. These are the things we look to running shoes for. Um, what we need to understand through the research and not talking about different types of shoes. However, if you wear just not talking about stability versus neutral versus motion control or any of that type stuff, but if you wear two different types of shoes, Again, if you don't wear that primary pair more than 58% of the time, research shows that you can reduce your potentially reduce your risk of injury about about 40%. So if you alternate through different running shoes throughout your week, don't always wear the same shoe every single time. This can actually have a good protective, um, can more of a protective risk factor for you. So you're reducing your likelihood of injury because you're exposing the foot, exposing the lower limb to different densities, uh, again, different materials, different geometries within that shoe, right? So you're exposing your foot to different demands on a regular basis to become stronger and more resilient, right? This goes back to that variable loading principle earlier. Again, specificity is wearing one shoe that works well for your foot. Variable loading is wearing multiple shoes that exposes your foot to different demands all the time, right? Running on the road versus running on the trail, right? There's a variability, there's a difference between those. Uh, we can use that same principle and apply that to footwear as well within reason, right? We don't want to think for some people, it might not work well to wear a, to go barefoot and then go in a hoka, right? Depending on the hoka, right? We, we want to have some similarities. We want that shoe to actually work for our foot, but different brands have different styles that have different drops and differentials, a different cushion, different upper, lower material, different insoles with them. Um, let's use that to our advantage and see if we can add more variability to the foot, which helps makes us stronger and more resilient to running. Um, like Bob mentioned earlier, right? Any sport, and I recommend it's different. So a lot of runners that are triathletes as well, right? We're still kind of in that endurance uh, sport class right there, still 
I think swimming's good, has more of a rotational component to it. Cycling, very sagittal, going through that motion. Running, very sagittal, going through that motion. Roger Federer here, moving laterally in different planes of motion, changing direction, stopping, absorbing energy, decelerating, pushing off, going the other way, moving forward, back, diagonals, every which motion. I wonder if you guys are watching the US Open right now, but um, being able to partake in different sports is super important. It actually is protective against running related injuries. So whether you're playing tennis, you're playing pickleball, you're, you're playing soccer, you're just fooling around at the park and, and incorporating some of these sports, you're getting in a recreational league. This is super helpful when it comes to your running because we're exposing the body to different demands outside of running to help again become a more well-rounded athlete. We want to be a well-rounded athlete first and a runner second, right? Rather than just being a runner with the higher risk of injury. Um, and then lastly, this study found that previous injury is one of the most significant risk factors. Uh, so making sure you're going through that rehab process. So biggest thing here, wear multiple pairs of shoes, partake in other sports activities that are running. If you have suffered from an injury in the past, do your due diligence and finish the rehab process. Okay, so last little poll here I'm going to throw up. Hope it doesn't get messed up on my screen again. A couple quick questions for you guys. See who's paying attention. See who fell asleep. Number one, foam rolling has been shown to deform fascial tissue and break up adhesions. Is that true or false? The hip, ankle, and what area are the three most important joints which require enough range of motion to run properly? Is that the knee, great toe, spine, or shoulder? Three, strength training is beneficial for runners because it this is more than one answer here. Builds resilience at the most commonly injured areas, improves running form, maximizes long-term bone health, improves running endurance economy. Question four, rotating through multiple pairs of shoe, running shoes during your weekly runs can reduce your risk of injury. Is that true or false? I'm gonna wait till 80% of you complete this. Mm -hmm. Catching you guys on a few of these, number two and number three specifically. Four. Okay, let's see if one more person is going to complete. I'm going to get five seconds. Last person might be uh, sleeping or eating dinner right now. All right, let's end up. Let's end, end the poll. Share the results. Okay, so form rolling has been shown to deform. Fascial tissue, breakup adhesions, that is false. The hip, ankle, and it's the great toe. Most of you got that right. Two of you said the knee. Um, knee doesn't go through a whole lot of range of motion compared to what it actually has at a joint. So it's the toe. Strength training is beneficial for runners because it, so we're all over the board here. It builds resilience at the most commonly injured areas. It does not improve running form, right? We need to add running retraining on top of strength training to improve running form. It maximizes long-term bone health and also improves running endurance and economy. So that A, C, and D. Four, rotating through multiple pairs of running shoes during your weekly runs can reduce your risk of injury. That is true. Nice job, guys. So as we wrap up here, how to best move forward with this information you need to follow a good running plan first and foremost. It's individualized to your needs and strategically prepares you for race day. Um, it needs to be smart. We need to minimize these training errors, right? Either progressing a program too quickly, increasing speed too quickly, just not meeting your individual needs with the program. A lot of people, you know, it's very common to, to print out some of these general programs online. Um, it's very important to find, can work with someone, create something that's a little bit more individualized. If you need help with that, I'm, I'm happy to help. Identify personal and running related risk factors. So what are the things that are in potentially increasing your, your risk of injury, making you more susceptible to injury? How do you address those on a regular basis? You might not need to go to the gym and strength train like an hour a day. It might be a handful of exercise that you do as your warm up, you do as your cool down, you do on off days in some way, right? But addressing some of these risk factors is important to be proactive with this rather than waiting and rehabbing from an injury, right? You can significantly, you can probably as you do these things over a long period of time, reduce your risk of injury um, rather than always having to respond to pain, going through PT, seeing doctors and doing all that, right? It's better to stay out of the medical system and be proactive than have to respond to these things. Then determine if you feel the benefits from foam rolling and static stretching. Research here was not what a lot of people wanted to hear, I can imagine. I wish these things were more proven in the research. It's very easy to tell a runner, hey, I want you to foam roll, just foam roll for five minutes and 
that would be okay. But unfortunately, the research does not really substantiate that for long-term benefits. We can see some short-term improvements there, but long-term, we don't see a lot of that. So um, if you like it, do it, but just understand that the research really does not back it up to the degree that a lot of people, especially a lot of runners think. Um, prevent decline of the body as you age, right? Every decade of life, unfortunately, right? So miserable to say, we're losing strength, we're losing muscle mass, we're losing bone density, we're losing power, we're losing stability and balance, right? Increased risk of falls as we get older. Continuing to stay active is important. Continue to run. Unfortunately, running is a very slow uh, endurance-based sport. So you want to make sure you're still doing some type of strength training alongside that could be body weight at home, core exercises, have some mobility in there, could be at the gym on machines, uh, free weights. Doesn't, I don't really care as long as you're doing some type of strength training. We need that more and more as we age. You're better off doing that now, creating a better foundation. So we're preventing the decline rather than waiting until it's already an issue. Then next, if you have abnormal running mechanics in any way, address with running and retraining. So we want to get you on the treadmill, perform a running analysis, see what needs to be addressed um, alongside your strength training and any kind of injury prevention program. So three things I want you to do right now. First, uh, I, I changed the order of this by accident. Um, ask questions. So somewhere on your screen, you'll see that Q&A button. If you have questions, I will definitely get to those questions here at the end as we get to the next slide. So ask questions as it relates to you, get those questions answered. Um, no, I will. I, I recommend scheduling that customization call. Let's dig into that stuff one-on-one -on -one. rather than giving you a general response right now. Let me understand the whole situation and give you the most uh, an individualized and actionable response. I want you to enter your name if you're interested to win that injury risk assessment. So we're going to do an evaluation. We're going to do a running analysis. Let me understand your, your past injury history, what races are coming up and let's figure out how to mitigate your risk of injury. We're not going to prevent it. Right. Even some of my runners get injured from time to time that's running. Um, but we can really reduce the risk of injury by doing the right things and being proactive and, and putting that together in a good way and a good plan that fits alongside your running. Um, and lastly, schedule that customization call. I'm trying to find the slide right here. So I'm going to send you a text here in the next couple of minutes um, with the link to schedule the customization call, regardless of whether you win the injury risk assessment, make sure you do that. I think this will be the perfect opportunity to help individualize the content from the webinar and to put it together in a way that actually helps you moving forward. But let me know right here. So do you want to enter your name? Yes or no? This is how I know who wants to enter. So I'm not entering anyone that doesn't want to be in it. I'm entering those that are interested um, to increase your chance of winning. Yes or no? Are you interested? And then are you interested in scheduling the free customization call? 30 minutes, pretty simple, but pretty impactful as well, just to make sure you're, uh, I don't want to see you in six months. I always say this, right? I don't want to see you in six months sitting on another webinar and saying you're still struggling with the same issue. Uh, literally, like, let's fix this right now and move on. There's, there's no need to waste time on some of these things, especially if the last couple of years have been, right, just so off. Let's just, let's, let's just live our lives and do the best we can. And that, that's what I say to a lot of people. So yes or no, I'm going to wait one more second here for an, a, one person to answer. We already know that last person fell asleep or is cooking dinner right now. So I'm going to give another 10 seconds and then let's get into the uh, Q and a here. I have a couple questions that I already wrote down from the sign up and the registration. All right, let's end this right now. So just so you know, I will be sharing the winner of the raffle tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Make sure you check that if you entered. I'm going to put the names into a hat, pull the lucky person, and we'll kind of we'll talk about how we're going to set up and, and execute that injury risk ass assessment. Super simple. Um, if you have questions, drop those questions in the Q&A right now. Joanne, awesome. Now... Just to answer some of these questions uh, I have as you guys write some in the Q&A and then we'll kind of go from there. And we'll probably take, I'll probably last about five minutes here on the, on, the, um, on the questions before we wrap up. And if there's anything else we wanna talk about, we can talk about in the customization call. But uh, Claudette asked, what is your opinion on footwear for running versus lifting? This is a good question. Not, not lifting or working out in your running shoes. 
uh, stay away from those as much as possible. Try to wear something flat, try to get the foot connected with the ground, go barefoot if possible. They have lifting shoes. I would try to get those. I would not necessarily get power lifting shoes that have a built-in heel. Um, I wanna try to get people onto the ground, feeling the floor as much as possible with their feet to help really can tap into that sensory input on the bottom of the foot, build balance, build stability, build control and dexterity throughout the foot and the toes, which helps improve movement up the chain. So a nice flat shoe. Um, I usually wear, I rarely wear shoes lifting. Uh, I would say uh, zero shoes, X-E-R-O. Uh, that's what I usually wear as I strength train. If I go to the gym and need to wear shoes, but other than that, it's usually barefoot as much as possible just to connect with the floor. Um, so I don't recommend any particular shoe for lifting. You do need to take into consideration, are there uh, foot issues? A lot of my people with um, just chronic plantar fascia issues, bunions and big toe pain, we might put them in a more stiff shoe just to make sure if we're doing some type of lunge or split squat, we're pushing on the toe, that they have some protection, but that's kind of the exception um, more than anything else. So Joanne, I think we need to talk about this. I was looking through what you what you wrote in the sign up too, and I think it's going to take a little bit more digging. So working in running shoes, house cleaner trying to go trying to get over knee and hamstring issues. So we need to dig into that more and see. So I'd say let's talk about that because I don't think right now, without knowing, I'm just going to give you some random information. I don't think it's going to help you in any way. Um, but I know I'll, I'll reach out and let's talk about that a little bit more just to see if we can give you some advice moving forward. Um, Diane, is trail running better than road running for knees or hips? It's different. It's different. It's more variable, right? It's more unpredictable, which could be good or bad depending on you. You're literally, right, uh, a lot of change in terrain, rocks, roots, moving side to side, jumping over things and having to navigate the trail. Um, so I would say in that standpoint, it's could potentially be harder on the knees and the hips just because it requires more stability, more control, um, different surface, right? It is technically a soft, softer surface, but what we knew through the research is our body auto regulates based on the surface. So a high hard surface, if we're running on concrete, our body's going to create less tension, less stiffness within the system, a nice soft surface, our body's going to create more tension within the system. So it, it usually nets out about zero. Um, but I think it's something good to add into your routine. I think from a variability standpoint, to add some running, add some roads, add some trails, experience a whole different uh, set of terrain, just you're not doing the same thing over and over again. Carlton asked, training recommendations to avoid injury for beginner intermediate runner, run approximately 25 miles per week, have run one half and training for a full marathon. So we know the injury risk naturally increases as you train for your first marathon. That's just per the research, right? You're, you're literally doubling your distance from a half marathon to a full marathon. Um, so I always recommend being proficient at the shorter distances and shorter for you here in this situation, anything half and under. Um, build a good uh, training plan, train consistently, uh, build good, again, tolerance to the demands of running, add a strength training pro program, possibly if you need it, if you have any injuries in the past, address those early on, well before you're actually preparing and building up for your race. Uh, and then once you feel confident working towards that full marathon, people oftentimes rush that next distance. I think being a little bit more conservative, taking your time, building a good foundation will only pay off in the end. Um, so being patient throughout that process as well. And uh, sorry, Diane, I hope that helped in some way. I think it really just depends on the person when it comes to trail running versus roads. I think it's all good. Uh, it just depends on, it just depends on you. Now, Chelsea said, just prevent knee injuries and something. And Joanne mentioned as well, um, depends on why we're experiencing these injuries. Is it actually running related? I know Joanne talked about, and I know you from the past. So um, with your business, uh, house cleaning and taking care of properties and all that kind of stuff. Are you constantly going up and down stairs? Are you having to kneel and you're putting a lot of pressure directly on the knee joint itself or the patella itself? Is it from running, right? Understanding why you're experiencing that knee pain is important. From a running standpoint, you can, there's so many good things you can do from a running standpoint. Um, make sure you're not overstriding, making sure you're not bouncing too much up and down as you run, making sure you're not crossing over, um, usually using cadence and a metronome to can bring in your stride a little bit, can significantly take some load off the knees. 
Um, that's usually where I go with people first. And then we, we talk about exercises to build more strength and resilience, depending on what the issues is. Is it a patellar tendon? Is it patella femoral? Is it IT band on the lateral knee, chondromalacia, meniscus, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of knee problems that are, are, that can happen is arthritis, right? And I have a lot of runners that, that deal with knee arthritis. Um, so understanding what the actual diagnosis is and how to go about that right way, I think is, is important. And Lynn says foam rolling is such a debate. I can probably just leave it at that right there from what I said earlier. So um, does it work? How long to do it for to be effective? Does it work for everyone? No, it doesn't work for everyone. Um, how long to do it for? There's no way to say. So like I said before, there's no consensus on how long to foam roll. Technically, we know the results are short-lived. Uh, now we get into like me, me giving my personal opinion. Foam roll as little as possible. If you love it, do it, follow it up with some kind of movement, but understand why do you need to foam roll? Does something always feel tight? If it feels tight, can we address that tissue with mobility? Can we address that tissue with strength training? Are we, do we have poor running form, right? I see a lot of people that say, um, you know what, my hamstring gets tight at this mileage. Okay, how is my glute strength? How is my running form? Where am I striking the ground? Am I pushing off and extending through the hip? Rather than over fo always foam rolling the hamstring because the hamstring gets tight, what is the underlying problem? The foam roller is often thrown at symptoms of problems rather than the problem itself. Uh, I don't want you to feel better temporarily. In fact, I hate to say this, but for a lot of my people, I'm okay getting rid of foam rolling and actually them feeling a little bit worse temporarily as we work on that root cause of the problem, right? Uh, I don't want this fake sense of satisfaction in, in relief. I want to address that, that issue and really get down to it. So I would say do it as much as you need to, but nothing more. More will never be better when it comes to the foam roller. More will just be more time spent foam rolling that probably doesn't translate over to the to end goal. Um, Andrea, how do you prevent injury in a previous injury? That's a good question. I know Andrea, I work with now, um, some, some knee injuries, uh, months ago, really uh, running form that like we talked about, uh, keeping the cadence up, which she has done a great job keeping her cadence up. We know increasing the cadence by 5% can reduce the really significantly reduce the load into the knee joint because we're not overstriding. We're not breaking. We're not creating a lot of load into that knee or as much. Um, strengthening, right? Your, it could be your traditional squats, split squats, could be working on hip strengthening, stability, strengthening the foot, foot dexterity, improving stability of the foot and the hip, which will better align the knee, right? All of these things are applicable um, when it comes to injuries, but making sure you're consistently staying on top of them. Um, even though you're feeling better, we don't just move on. We continue to strengthen, continue to address these things for a long period of time. Um, sometimes we can just continue to addressing these things forever just to improve get overall quality of the uh, tissue. Mary Lynn says tips specifically for older runners. Um, I don't get into the age thing as much, right? I, I was speaking with a lot of new people this week too. And, oh, I'm turning 50. I'm turning 60. And I want to do this before I can't know any longer. In my opinion, if you're following a good training program, you're going to continue to see benefits and results. I'm not sure what that ceiling is on that, but we are declining every decade of life in some way, bone mass, muscle mass, power, uh, just overall tissue quality. So you need to make sure you're addressing it. If you've never done strength training, you didn't play a lot of sports growing up as a kid, uh, there's a good chance that Again, you're going to be a little bit in a little bit weaker, a little bit less powerful than someone that's been doing those things their entire life. Um, but I think the strength training piece is huge for older runners. Uh, we can get away with adding a little bit of strength training and actually reducing the amount of running potentially. If you have a history of injuries, right? Instead of running five, six days a week, you can probably get away with running three to four with some kind of strength training or smart cross training in the mix. But just really depends on, on your needs. And I think following a specific training program, uh, being smart about your training, respecting the recovery process, bones, usually in tendons become more of a, an issue as we get older. Um, so we need to make sure nutrition is also huge, right? Something I didn't talk about here today, but are we fueling the body in a way that's going to uh, allow us to function at our best as we run? So we're not Again, taking as much from the system, are we giving the nutrients to recover good calcium, good vitamin D, good iron, right? Those things are going to promote an optimal health, uh, bone mineral density, and those things get older. So it's really looking at the complete picture of sleep, stress management, 
recovery, nutrition, strength training, running, right? Your program might become a little bit more well-rounded as you get older. And that might be necessary just to make sure you stay, stay healthy and reduce your risk of injury. So Bob, what are your thoughts on deep tissue massage? I think it depends. Again, depends on the, depends on what your reason is of using that. And I always say after a couple of massages, you're going to know pretty quickly, is that helping you? Um, uh, do you need to get massaged? Some people need to go on a regular basis. Do we need to go every two weeks to get those benefits? There's a good chance that similar to the foam rolling, um, either the massage is addressing the symptoms and improving the symptoms, or maybe it's, it's you doing something in those, that two week period of time that you're again, going against or working against the massage that's helping you. It's really hard to say. Um, but I think it's important. Massage is important, especially from a recovery standpoint for runners, just trying to promote an optimal tissue quality. So I definitely recommend getting massage. Um, however, it just really depends on why you need that on a regular basis. Some of my clients get massage. Most of them don't. I feel like the stronger and more resilient you are in the body is the, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, um, the less you need to do other stuff in the process if you're following a good program. Um, so that it kind of just, just depends. All right, guys. So let's wrap up. I uh, appreciate you guys. You probably should have got a text from me not too long ago. Make sure you're scheduling that customization call. I'll announce the winner to the raffle uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. I'll send the webinar replay. Feel free to reach out anytime with questions. Let's talk about these things. Let's get you on a specific program uh, to see the best results. And once again, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me on this Tuesday evening. Thanks again and have a great night.